In diagnostic imaging, it's a well-established fact that MRI can be used to determine the approximate age of a hematoma or bleed in the body, especially within the brain. We are told that this phenomenon is possible because of the evolutionary changes in the T1 and T2 signal characteristics of the hemoglobin molecule in an aging thrombus, roughly characterized as hyperacute, isointense to brain on T1, and hyperintense on T2, acute, hypointense to brain on T1 and dark on T2, early subacute, bright on T1 and dark on T2, late subacute, bright on T1 and bright on T2, and chronic, dark on T1 and dark on T2. Most of us just simply memorize this chart for the test or look it up when we see a bleed on the MRI submitted for interpretation, but over the next few minutes, in an effort to help you actually understand rather than rotely memorize these signal changes, we're going to review the overall structure of hemoglobin with details of the heme molecule, which is predominantly responsible for the observed signal changes. Mammalian hemoglobin is a metalloprotein consisting of four globin subunits, two alpha and two beta, each of which houses the iron-containing heme molecule. So as you can see, there are four heme molecules and four iron atoms per hemoglobin. To simplify a little bit, let's take a closer look at one of the four subunits. The subunit can be split into its protein globulin, which forms a watertight folded complex around the non-protonaceous iron-containing heme molecule. Since this is where most of the action takes place, let's get into some details of the heme component. At first glance, this molecule looks a little daunting, but we're going to break it down for you and hopefully you'll see it's really not that bad. The central portion of heme consists of four carbon-nitrogen pentagonal molecules called pyrrole rings, each of which possesses its sole nitrogen atom closest to the molecular center. Each of these rings is then linked with a methene bridge, basically a single carbon attached to one of the rings with a double bond, the other ring with a single bond, and one hydrogen atom to complete the requisite four bonds to each of the carbon atoms. Two side chains dangle off each of the four pyrrole rings to complete the molecule. This structure is called a porphyrin ring and is basically a chelating agent for the central oxygen transporting iron atom. Before we complete our molecule, let's take a closer look at this central iron atom. The Roman numeral 2 below the iron symbol represents the oxidative state of the iron cation of plus 2. This is the ferrous form of iron and is the configuration found in the normally functioning heme molecule. Iron can actually exist in multiple oxidative states from minus 2 to plus 7, but plus 2 and plus 3 are most common, with the plus 3 representing the ferric form of the cation. This form of iron will be important when we're talking about the older hematomas in a moment, but for now, let's get back to our ferrous iron. To complete our heme molecule, we simply need to attach the pyrrole ring to our ferrous iron atom. If you remember from basic chemistry, or you've seen some of my previous videos on this channel, you know that for a complete stable molecule, each carbon atom has to have four connections to other atoms, nitrogen 3, oxygen 2, and hydrogen 1. I'm not going to go through the whole molecule to confirm the proper number of bonds, but I do want to focus on the four nitrogen atoms at the center of the porphyrin ring. Two of the four nitrogens only have two connections to adjacent atoms, and therefore will form standard covalent bonds with the adjacent iron atom completing each of the nitrogen's three connections. However, the other two nitrogens already have their requisite three bonds to adjacent atoms and should be complete. This seems to pose a problem if we want to securely fixate the iron atom to the entire carrier porphyrin ring, but fortunately there is a solution. In our video on gadolinium, another metal cation, we talked about the unusual chemical bonding that exists between our chelating molecule and the metal ion itself. Briefly reviewing, the type of bonds that we are all familiar with from our high school chemistry class are called covalent bonds, where each of the atoms shares one of its valence electrons with its atomic neighbor, allowing each to complete their valence subshells for molecular stability. For instance, the simplest hydrocarbon, methane, consists of a central carbon atom with four valence electrons, requiring four more electrons to complete its unfilled orbitals, which is attached to four hydrogen atoms with one valence electron, each requiring one additional electron to complete its unfilled subshell. The carbon shares one of its four electrons with each of the hydrogen atoms, giving them their requisite two, and in return, the hydrogens share their lone electron with the carbon, giving this atom a total of eight. Similarly, 
The simple water molecule has a single oxygen atom with six valence electrons bound to two hydrogen atoms. Sharing their electrons, again, gives oxygen its magical eight, and each of the hydrogens their two. Everyone's happy. Since each atom is sharing at least one of its valence electrons with its neighbor, this type of bond is called covalent. However, these metal atoms have already given up some electrons to make them a positively charged metal cation, and in the process become very electron selfish, unwilling to share their valence electrons with their fellow atoms, but are more than willing to take electrons from other atoms, most notably oxygen and nitrogen. They receive these electrons at what we call coordinate sites, of which iron has six. Looking at water, you can see the molecule is polar with the positively charged hydrogens asymmetrically binding to the oxygen. The two free electrons on the far side of the oxygen make this portion of the molecule slightly negative. These two free orbital electrons are the ones that oxygen shares with iron to form a chemical bond. Since both electrons originate from the oxygen atom with no contribution from iron, this is called a coordinate covalent or dative bond, and we'll represent that bond with this dashed arrow to indicate the asymmetric participation of the atoms. Other examples of dative bonds include the oxygen molecule that makes up 21% of our atmosphere, and various nitrogen molecules which again, because of the relative asymmetric bonding, creates a polar free pair of electrons that the atom is willing to donate to the iron atom. So, with this new information, let's go back to our porphyrin ring. Based on our discussion, we can see that the remaining two nitrogens in the center of the ring, which already have their requisite three connections, can still form coordinate covalent or dative bonds with the ferrous iron completing the heme molecule. Remember that iron has six coordinate sites. We've used a total of four with the two covalent and two dative bonds attaching the iron atom to the nitrogens of the porphyrin ring. The fifth site attaches the heme molecule to the pentagonal histidine through a standard covalent bond with the apical nitrogen, and the other end of the histidine chain is attached to the globin protein, a portion of which is shown here. This leaves one coordinate site open, which is where most of the action actually takes place. This is the oxygen-carrying portion of the heme molecule forming a temporary data for coordinate covalent bond with O2. With the completed molecule, we can now dive right into the MR characteristics of the various forms of hemoglobin, but for clarity, I want to take a quick moment to review some interesting features of iron, meat, and magnetism that are actually all relevant to our discussion. Let's start with iron and meat. 35% of the Earth's entire mass is made up of iron, most of which is found in the core and mantle. The outer crust is about 5% iron. We're all familiar with the reddish and brown hues found in a rusty piece of steel which represents the various forms of iron oxide. Similarly, iron provides the brilliant reds and browns seen in the stunning geologic formations around the world. Iron is also responsible for the healthy red colors we associate with a fresh steak or the darker meats of domesticated poultry like the chicken drumsticks and thighs. These pigments are due to an oxygen-carrying molecule in these meats called myoglobin. Similar to hemoglobin with a protein globin surrounding an iron-containing heme molecule, myoglobin is found in animal muscles thought to be used for endurance. The myoglobin stores a readily available local source of oxygen to keep the muscles working normally during extended periods of activity. Comparing the domestic chicken to wild ducks, chickens don't fly but use their wings for short bursts of lift and therefore don't need an abundant oxygen reserve. As such, their powerful pectoral muscles contain almost no myoglobin, making them a white meat. Ducks, on the other hand, fly long distances, and their pectoral muscles consume a lot of energy and oxygen in the process. The abundant myoglobin in their pectoral muscles gives this meat its reddish hue. Chickens do spend a lot of time walking the farm looking for grubs and bugs, so the muscles of the legs containing myoglobin providing the familiar dark meat of the drumsticks and thighs. Similarly, beef and dairy cattle spend most of their entire existence roaming the pastures while grazing, and the oxymyoglobin provides both the oxygen reserve and rich redness of a fresh steak. With regards to magnetism, the three most common types are, in order of increasing strength, diamagnetism, paramagnetism, and ferromagnetism, depending predominantly on the number of unpaired electrons orbiting the nucleus. For all intents and purposes, diamagnetism with all paired electrons really has no notable magnetic effect, both macroscopically and with regards to MR imaging. 
paramagnetism is probably the most interesting in MRI because the strongly paramagnetic cation gadolinium with seven unpaired electrons is used as a T1 contrast agent, but the effect is dose limited. Small amounts of a paramagnetic substance in the vicinity of hydrogen protons increases T1 signal, but in higher concentrations, the strong induced local magnetic field produces susceptibility artifact that destroys both the T1 and T2 signal, making them dark on the MRI. Finally, ferromagnetism is limited to basically three or four elements, nickel, cobalt, and of course iron metal. Gadolinium becomes ferromagnetic below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, well below body temperature, so really not relevant to MR imaging. While the iron metal is strongly ferromagnetic, the metal cation in the center of the heme molecule can range from diamagnetic to super paramagnetic depending on its oxidative state and attachment to other molecules. This and the changing local environment of the hemoglobin molecule is the key to the varying T1 and T2 signals seen in an aging thrombus. Now we're ready to talk about some hematomas. A hyperacute bleed is seen in the first 24 hours after an arterial disruption. Since this is coming from an artery, 95% of the hemoglobin will be carrying an oxygen molecule and therefore this complex is appropriately labeled oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin has no unpaired electrons and is therefore diamagnetic with no substantial local magnetic effect. We would therefore expect the hyperacute bleed to look identical to the surrounding CSF which is dark on T1 and bright on T2 weighted images. However, the proteins of the red blood cells, plasma, and globin molecule contain hydrogen protons which provide some T1 signal making the hyperacute bleed isointense to the adjacent brain on a T1 weighted image and isointense to CSF on the T2 weighted image. This, of course, can make a small hyperacute bleed very difficult to see on standard T1 and T2 weighted images. Oxyhemoglobin and oxymyoglobin are both bright red, hence the color of arterial blood and the surface of a fresh steak exposed to atmospheric oxygen. From one to three days, the hematoma is considered acute. With no available fresh oxygen, the heme molecule loses its oxygen molecule, becoming deoxyhemoglobin. The deoxygenated ferrous ion in the heme molecule now has four free electrons and becomes strongly paramagnetic. The high concentration of these paramagnetic ions inside the red blood cells causes susceptibility artifact from distortion of the local magnetic field, making the deoxyhemoglobin dark on both T1 and T2 weighted images. Deoxyhemoglobin has a blue or purplish hue, hence the color of venous blood. If you look at this thin stake, you can see the purple discoloration on a portion of the surface. This is not spoiled or bruised. In fact, this stake was in the same package used to demonstrate oxymyoglobin. The area was simply covered by the adjacent slice of stake, which shielded the myoglobin from ambient oxygen producing deoxymyoglobin and the purplish hue. The meat will turn back to its expected red color if left out for a few hours. The early subacute phase is seen from 3 to 7 days. In the continued absence of oxygen, the ferrous cation at the center of each heme molecule loses one more electron and changes its oxidative state from plus 2 to the ferric form of plus 3. This form of iron is called methemoglobin and has five unpaired electrons, making it even more paramagnetic than deoxyhemoglobin, and we would therefore assume that it would cause even more dephasing and signal loss than the deoxyhemoglobin of the acute thrombus. However, this conversion to ferric iron is also associated with a conformational change of the surrounding globin molecule. Remember the normal hemoglobin is watertight, only allowing gases like oxygen and carbon monoxide to interact with the heme molecule. With this conformational change, water now enters the center of the globin protein, and the oxygen atom on the water molecule can form temporary dative bonds with the paramagnetic ferric cation, producing aquamet hemoglobin. With the water's hydrogen protons now in the vicinity of the ferric ion, they experience the local paramagnetic effect, reducing their T1 relaxation and increasing the signal of the hematoma on a T1 weighted image, which now becomes bright. Because the ferric iron is still concentrated within the red blood cell, the regional susceptibility artifact dominates on the long TE sequence, making intracellular aquamet hemoglobin dark on the T2 weighted image. This stake is from the same package used to demonstrate oxy and deoxymyoglobin. I just left it in the refrigerator for about a week to demonstrate the conversion to metmyoglobin. As you can see, 
the meat, even though it's still raw, has turned brown. This reflects the abundant metmyoglobin indicative of the aging process. Cooking the meat rapidly converts the iron cation from ferrous to ferric, thus the brown color of a well-cooked steak. The late subacute phase ranges from 7 to 14 days. The dominant heme species is still met hemoglobin, but now we see the degradation of red blood cells in the hematoma, which break down and release the met hemoglobin into the matrix of the clot. Again, since the met hemoglobin is paramagnetic and has access to the hydrogen protons of water, this late subacute hematoma is still bright on the T1-weighted image. However, the paramagnetic compound is no longer concentrated in the intracellular compartment of the red blood cell and therefore there is less regional susceptibility artifact. As such, no significant dephasing of the protons is seen on the long TE sequence, making extracellular met hemoglobin bright on T2-weighted images as well. A chronic hematoma is seen after about two weeks. This phase is dominated by the further breakdown of hemoglobin components, producing a variety of MR-active molecules. The globin chain begins to fragment, producing small protein strands, one of which may still be attached to the heme molecule. Some of these protein histidine heme complexes can further degrade, losing their ferric iron and porphyrin ring, producing a free protein histidine complex. The open binding site on the apical nitrogen can then bind covalently to the six coordinate site of other intact heme molecules, producing a heme sandwich between two histidine protein complexes called hemichromes. Hemichromes have a greenish hue and could explain the greenish color seen on aging red meats. These complexes are also diamagnetic and therefore do not exert a significant effect on the local MR signal. However, simultaneously, some of the free iron cations released in the process are gathered into the normal local storage units called ferritin, basically a hollowed out ball of 24 protein subunits that holds a few hundred to a few thousand iron atoms in its core. This cluster of iron cations has more than 10,000 free electrons, making it super paramagnetic, which markedly decreases the T2 relaxation, making the chronic clot dark on both T1 and T2 weighted images. In addition, an amorphous collection of fragmented proteins, ferritin storage units, free iron, and lipids accumulate in the clot matrix, producing hemosiderin. With more than 100,000 free electrons, hemosiderin is also considered superparamagnetic, further disrupting the local NMR signal, making the chronic clot dark on both T1 and T2 weighted images. This hemosiderin is then picked up by macrophages and the reticular endothelial system and deposited on the hematoma wall, giving the familiar hemosiderin ring seen in chronic hemorrhage often associated with a cavernous angioma. Okay, that was tough. A lot of information and a little bit of time, but hopefully, with a little review, understanding the process of hematoma evolution will help you quickly recall the MRI signal characteristics of an aging thrombus. One last review before we wrap this up. The hyperacute bleed is less than 24 hours old with the dominant hemoglobin species, oxyhemoglobin. The acute bleed is 1 to 3 days with the dominant hemoglobin species, deoxyhemoglobin. Early subacute is 3 to 7 days with the dominant hemoglobin species, intracellular aquamet hemoglobin. Late subacute is 7 to 14 days, dominated by extracellular aquamet hemoglobin. Finally, the chronic hematoma is greater than two weeks old with multiple breakdown products of hemoglobin including hemichromes, ferritin, and hemosiderin, the latter two products dominating the T1 and T2 signal characteristics of the chronic thrombus. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.